This episode may contain sensitive language not suitable for children. Welcome back to Season 2 of Three Black Eyes Unfiltered, the podcast that brings truth to light. Listen to present-day historical events that shaped our history and will determine our future. It's presented by moderator Raymond Dunn and expert Marvin Dunn. I am Dr. Marvin Dunn. I'm the author of several books dealing with black history in Florida. My first book was on the Miami Riot of 1980, Crossing the Bounds. It was written by myself and Bruce Porter. I've also written Black Miami in the 20th Century, and it deals with the history of lynching in Florida. And my latest book is called A History of Florida Through Black Eyes, and it traces the history of blacks in Florida from the arrival of black people with the Spanish. These books are available on Amazon. In this episode, we will discuss the civil rights movement and our guests who were involved in that movement in St. Augustine, Florida. I would like to have our two guests to introduce themselves. Let's start with Sam. Yes, uh, Raymond. Uh, my name is Samuel Wilkerson. I grew up in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, went to school at Richard J. Murray High School. Graduated in 1964. Okay, and let's move to James. Yes, my name is James Williams. I was born in Georgia, and I moved to St. Augustine, and I went to Richard J. Murray High School. Okay, we're going to discuss your involvement in the civil rights movement in St. Augustine. Marvin, I'm going to ask you for the sake of our audience, give us just a brief uh, summary of what happened in St. Augustine. Sure. There were two cities in Florida where the civil rights movement was very, very active. Tallahassee was one of those, and St. Augustine in 1964 uh, was the other. Dr. Robert Halings was a dentist in St. Augustine who was the focal point for the demonstrations in St. Augustine for civil rights. I think those demonstrations were mainly uh, based around uh, working rights for sanitation workers. Um, and uh, they wanted Dr. King to come to, to St. Augustine in 1964 to participate in these demonstrations. King did agree, and he arrived in St. Augustine, participated in several demonstrations, mainly using uh, high school students, young people, uh, as a way of making the point that uh, youth could be a very effective weapon in bringing forth change in civil rights. So the civil rights movement in, in Tallahassee was a very, very... Um, uh, confrontational. Uh, there were a number of arrests. Dr. King himself was arrested. There's a famous photograph of Dr. King sitting in the back of a police car with a German Shepherd dog next to him. I remember that. That, that photograph was taken in St. Augustine. So the uh, the fact of having two people here who were there, uh, who lived through those days in 1964, uh, just as the Congress was considering the Civil Rights Bill at a very, very turbulent time, and the history of our nation and in the history of Florida. We are blessed to have these two gentlemen uh, here today. So uh, let's hear from them and, and get an idea of just how it was to have been in St. Augustine in 1964. Well, I too want to thank both of you for being guests on our show. And I want you to understand that this program is directed towards the youth of today. So I want you to explain to us as young people in the 60s, how did you get involved in this whole civil rights movement? Sam? Well, during that time, I was about 17, maybe 18 years old, a senior in high school. Dr. Haley started the movement by having the young kids to come out and march, and we marched at night. The reason why he chose the young people because the same people that uh, our parents couldn't march because they were working for some of the people that were against integrating uh, the schools and various uh, uh, stores and restaurants during that time. That is a very interesting uh, tidbit for our young audience to understand. They were particularly why, parents. Adults, why adults yeah. didn't get out in the street as much as the youth did? Uh, Marvin, is that typically what happened in most other cities? No, it's not. Uh, it's typical of what happened in South, South Africa. Okay. Mandela used kids uh, to press the, 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 the uh, war against uh, apartheid. Now, King did a very unusual thing in St. Augustine. He really put young people on the front line. That didn't happen in many other places. So this was a unique uh, moment in the civil rights movement. Uh, let, yeah. let me, and let, you got to remember during that time, uh, St. Augustine 
did have one of the black colleges, which is located here in Miami now, is uh, was the Florida Memorial College, mm-hmm. and he used students also from Florida Memorial mm-hmm. and. The high school, which I graduated from, was right down the street, uh, Richard J. Murray High School. So okay. he used both students from the college, and the um, he just took leaders from the, the college and the high school. And we did our marching and our demonstrating uh, during those times. Well, let me ask you, what your parents say about this? My folks didn't know it until I was in jail. Now, wait a second. <laughs> You let your behind get arrested before you told your mom and daddy what you were doing. Uh, wait, hold, hold on, hold on. Uh, <laughs> wait, don't, uh, don't let him get off. I, no, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. But just to nail that point home, yeah. When I demonstrated in Tallahassee, I was in jail for eleven days before our mother knew that I was in jail. Finish telling him about it, James. Go ahead, James. Yeah, uh, I was in jail, and my father found out, and my aunts found out, and. What happened? They got on my dad because he wouldn't come go get me. You go and get that boy out of jail. He don't know nothing about going to jail. How long were you in jail? Oh, I was only in three days. You didn't mean to come out. You didn't want to come out. I didn't want to come out. No, that I was supposed to be there for three days. So after three days, you got out just through the process rather than your dad coming to get you out. So when you got home, what did your dad say to you? Oh, boy, we had a party when we got out. (laughs) Party? I thought you were going to get you behind. No, no. no. So he was okay with it once once you got got, out. Just don't do it again? No, I vomit all over the floor, and he cleaned it up. And he didn't know. He thought it was the jail food. (laughs) You see, you lying again. (laughs) Jane, give us a little more detail about the actual arrest. How how did it take place? Oh, we was, uh, it was Woodworth that we was in at the dime store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. The lunch counter. And, uh, well, we was at the Ponce Leon Hotel. Oh, that's the big one. Very famous hotel. Hold hold, hold on, Jane, just a minute, Marvin, quickly. Tell our audience uh, what that is, the Ponce Leon Hotel. It's one of the largest hotels in Florida. I think, I think Flagler built it. Yes. So it's a huge, magnificent hotel. Right. Henry Flagler built that Mm -hmm. in in St. Augustine, and I think he had another one in West Palm Beach. Oh, he had several. He had one in Miami, the Roy Palm. He had had several. Yeah, he didn't mean for black folk to be going into into his hotels, except to serve white people. Okay, James, tell us about it. So we went there. When they came in to arrest, they gave us a choice whether we want to be arrested or go home. And I choose, me and some more friends choose to go home. And uh, once everybody else was arrested, we missed them. So we went out to be sent back downtown. Oh. Did you go back out to, to demonstrate again so you would then right. be? So yes, I saw photographs of kids asking to be arrested. Yeah, so can we be arrested, you know, at uh, Woodworth? the food counter that we wasn't supposed to uh be. Okay. Now, did the police mishandle you? Did they abuse you? Did they curse you when they were arresting you? Well, the one that stood by me had a cattle prod, and I never want to be stuck with a cattle prod. So uh, when he told me I was under arrest. Tell us about your arrest. What happened with you? I never was arrested. I I was one of the, what you call, slick ones. (laughs) Oh. Wait a minute. How, How were you slick? Just by avoiding them, but I. Well, where, just did, did, where did you march? Where did you actually participate? Mm-hmm. Well, all the marches were downtown. Mm-hmm. It was two churches that we marched from. Mm-hmm. It was St. Paul and yes. First Baptist, yeah, and we marched from there to downtown, and we did that practically every night. Now, did Dr. Okay. King participate in any of the ones where no, you, you participated? No, no, Dr. King. He was like a overseer. And I must say that we did have people like Jose Williams, uh, Ralph Abernathy, uh, Jesse Jackson, and Andrew Young. Andrew Young. Those yeah. are the ones that I can those, think yeah, of. Those right are now. his main main yeah. lieutenants. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the yeah. things that I, I want to highlight here from your discussion is the involvement of the church. I want our young audience to understand that. This civil rights movement was successful in part because of the participation of the church. Um, Yes, and the church was the meeting place. Mm -hmm. That's where uh, Dr. King had all the meetings. And every uh, meeting that, well, it actually wasn't a meeting, it was speeches. And 
the the uh, the meetings we didn't never attend. None of the kids didn't never attend. I guess it was uh, Dr. Helens and the prominent people that were mm -hmm. in the city. Those are the ones that had to sit, and I'm sure that they were at the meetings. But the marches they were started from the churches, and we that's where we started from. The churches, all exception of one time that uh, we started from a high school. We went in one day, and maybe James, you want to elaborate on that? Um, uh, leaving the school. Yes. Well, we was in class, and you know, all it take is one person really to start singing. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. <laughs> walking down the hall, and then. The teachers can stop you then. Everybody left the schoolhouse. The police couldn't stop us. We went and marched downtown. Mm -hmm. Just out of the school, straight downtown, marching, singing. Yeah, down the street. Wouldn't yeah. it be lovely to see that sort of thing from kids today? All the things that kids could be marching down the street, oh, protesting the, today? Well, the kids nowadays, you know, they, they didn't do it the way we did it because we wouldn't have got anywhere telling the police we, we going to march and you got to protect us and all that. No, they the police was there to whoop our head. During that time, we didn't have but one, maybe two black police officers in St. John County. And um, they patrol basically the, the, where all the, the blacks used to stay, which was on the west side. Well, I don't know who called, but somebody called them and they met us before we got downtown, but they didn't know that half of us was going down the streets and half of us was going down the railroad track. So he stopped the ones that were going down the street, but the ones on the railroad track, we bypassed the uh, streets and took the back streets. Mm -hmm. you know, and was, we went downtown and Woolworths and the, um, the hotel. Let's take a moment to reintroduce our guests for folks who may have tuned in late. Uh, James, <laughs> would you say a few words again about who you are? James Williams from St. Augustine, Florida. I, went, I attended Richard J. Murray High School, graduated in 64, and I did march in the civil rights. And Sam? Uh, my name is Samuel Wilkerson. I also attend Richard J. Murray High School, and I graduated in 64, and James and I were classmates in the same school during the same time and graduated together. And we just found out that James's wife attended that same high school, right? Right? She attended Richard J. Murray High, but she was sent over to St. Augustine High, the okay. white school. Okay, so tell us, James, uh, if you will, about uh, your your wife's experience in going over to that high school. She was one of the first black students to integrate that white high school. She was one of, three one of three first uh, blacks to go to St. Augustine. What year do you think that was, 65, 66, somewhere in 65, there? About 65. After the demonstrations. Okay, yes. please go ahead. And uh, she went over there and... Uh, why did she go? Did she just up and went? Or was there some plan by the NAACP or someone else to it was, get her? It was planned for them to go, by the and NAACP. she volunteered, okay. and her okay. mother let her go. Okay. So uh, what happened? Well, she was over there, and uh, she has everything that happened to her, you know, all the tanks that were sitting in her seat, all the hanging black dolls that was, you know, and the fights. And uh, she has all that. She still have it. Mm -hmm. You said there were three girls. Three girls, it, yeah. Was there a, a, a male, a boy that was involved as well? Yes, it was a boy involved. What happened to him? He was scared and he couldn't take it. So the girls had to lead the way. Right. Well, well, well. well. Dropped out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, what happened at St. Augustine Beach? Was there a wait in or something that took place? Oh, boy, was we waiting in. You know, we was in tools, and police had uh, was protect, was supposed to be protecting us, and they used to bust through the line. I think I got hit, I got spit on several times, you okay. know, because I used to go to the beach just about okay. every day. We had to do everything before twelve o'clock because we had to get on the six o'clock news. Walter Conkright. Good, good play too. There's a famous photograph of the of the demonstrations at St. Augustine Beach, showing police there in the water with you, standing in the water, and then eventually this melee breaks out, and 
they're whipping heads. I understand they arrested white and black people that day. Is that correct? Well, you you, you arrest the reporters that had cameras and everything. They arrested them too. Right, because they didn't want that, you know, out. They used to take the cameras and throw them out and break them, you know. Sam, were you involved in that? No, also? I didn't participate in the uh, in the weigh-ins at the schools. I, I mean, at the beaches. No, I did not. I also would like to say that there were a couple of our classmates, Arjunel Edwards and Joanne Anderson, they were in our class, the class of 1964, and they were the ones that were arrested and sent to the reform school, and they stayed there for about six to eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to get them uh, so they can come and, and, and share their experience with them, but I was unable to get in touch with Thank them. Thank you for trying. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay, and we, we will make sure that we put the word out that we certainly appreciate what they did uh, and their efforts in the civil rights movement. Ardrinelle Edwards mm -hmm. and Joanne Anderson. Okay, uh, I want to ask you that, both of you, uh, another question. Uh, did in any way your experience as teenagers in the civil rights movement uh, lead you towards uh, civic activism as adults? Like, was that the beginning of your becoming a, uh, an activist, or did you do that part, and then you pretty much let civic activism in, in your own lives kind of fade away? Well, in my part, yes, we kind of let it fade away. Uh, during that time, when we were doing it, number one, it was fun, mm -hmm. but it was a purpose, too. And the purpose of, I don't know whether our audience know that during that time, they were trying times. There were black people couldn't go into restaurants. They couldn't go to um, theaters. theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the theaters, um, I thought we had the best seats in the house. We had to go to the side door and go up the stairs in order to see the movies. But we had the best seat in the house, but they didn't know it. <laughs> but <laughs> You know, I, just to, to digress for a moment, when movies opened in Miami, the first movies opened downtown Miami, they let black people go to those movies, uh, to the theater, but they had to sit in the balcony. Yeah, that but guess was what, the balcony. Right, but guess what happened once the lights went down? Oh, yeah. They <laughs> popcorn, popcorn and uh, all kinds of things started raining down on the white folks. These yeah. colored folks need to have their own movie theater. So they opened three or four movie houses in Miami. Well, we did. Blacks. We did. We had a, a movie theater. Um, St. Augustine was thriving with black businesses during that time. But we felt that we were being left out of going to places that we thought that we should go because we paid the same taxes that the other people paid. So... Right. Um, Dr. Haley and uh, some more prominent people, they got together and they called in, like you said earlier, Dr. King, and um, we started the program to go on. You know, something else happened, the interesting happened during uh, those days in St. Augustine. I believe the, the mother of the governor of Massachusetts was arrested she was. for demonstrating in St. Augustine. Oh, I have a picture of that. Do you? Yes. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that, that, that. Uh, Go ahead. I had to go downtown and what what would you call it when you have to survey what's going on? Her and Dr. King went to jail together. I had to be there so I can go back and tell what happened. Oh, they actually like arrested. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mrs. Peabody. That's was correct. Mrs. Peabody, the mother the of the governor, governor of, Massachusetts, of Massachusetts. And that right. brought the national media into St. Augustine in a very, very big way and gave King the kind of national stage he needed in St. Augustine. Augustine. She got there. I believe, because Dr. King asked a uh, minister friend of his to be involved, and then he got all these other ministers of all sorts. I'm not sure how Mrs. Peabody got involved, but a lot of other folks got involved. As a matter of fact, um, it was the largest involvement of, of rabbis all right. in a civil rights movement took place in St. Yeah, Augustine. Jewish people, yeah. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, they, were, they were arrested. It was the largest arrest of rabbis in U.S. history. Right. Okay. Very interesting. And we had, you know, like white folks, we had, um, you know, thumb and rise on spring break up from up north to come down to help us demonstrate. Uh -huh. Now, we did have white folks there that would help us, and they was able to get into some of the Klan meetings and everything, mm -hmm. you know. I want to cover one other thing that happened during that time. You guys may remember, wasn't there was a famous photograph 
of the manager of the Monson. hotel, the, of the Monsoon Hotel, right. where you all, I don't know if you all were involved, but some of the Throwing demonstrations the in, yeah, went in into, the into, the, into this ho- hotel swimming pool trying to integrate it, and there's this manager pouring acid into the pool, and you guys, these demonstrators were in the pool, and did not get out. Were you there? Or what, what do you know about or recall about that particular incident at the Mona Lodge? Um, I, I really can't record. To, in my head, I was there looking at it, but I wasn't involved in the pool or anything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's yes. a, a few folks, just a handful of people actually in the swimming yes. pool. Right. Yeah, neither was I. I, I didn't take part in in um, uh, in the pool during that time, but I remember it well. Uh, I think Dr. King, if you have ever been to St. Augustine, um, uh, the Monson Hotel is right on the bayfront. The bayfront is uh, in front of the Bayfront is the St. John River. Yeah. Okay, and they got a seawall there, and that's where Dr. King was observing everything from. And after that, then he came over, and um, they tried to interview him then. But, uh, no, I didn't take part in that at all. Okay, well, for our, our listening audience, uh, a photograph of that incident uh, involving the pool is on our Instagram. So if any of our listeners would like to see the picture of that you just described, Marvin, of the hotel manager pouring acid in the pool yeah. from black people. Last year, I stayed at, I stayed overnight at what had been the Munson Hotel. It's now it has another name, it's a Hilton or something. Same location. And the swimming pool is still there. Mm-hmm. It looks small by comparison. <laughs> but that same swimming pool is still there, and I was there about a year ago just for an overnight trip. Course, and, and we are talking about the oldest city in the nation, and right across the street was the old fort. That's right. It, yep, I, yeah. I visited that, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, gentlemen, now, do you think that the youth of today really, really look back and give a damn about what you did and the chances that you took, the risk that you took going to jail? Does it matter to them, you think? No, I don't think they couldn't take what we did. Well, they couldn't march because the pants are down around the thighs. So how are you going to march with your? I don't know. All right, Mark, right. Get, okay, get off of fashion. <laughs> we're, we're talking about seriously. Think about the issues of today. They don't know criminal justice reform. We're yeah. talking about about immigration. You know, we're talking about the issues that they're faced with today. Are, are, are they really? that involved and I'm not talking about our our politicians. Yeah, but Ray, a lot of adults aren't involved. I don't I don't expect youth to be involved in those kinds of issues. We weren't. When I was seventeen, I didn't give a damn about immigration, this or anything else. We were kids. It's like you said, it was fun. It was something to do. It happened to have been for a good social cause. I am more concerned about the adults who are listening to this who don't know, who haven't done, uh, and who are not doing anything. And so does this give adults a second chance? Maybe though some of them didn't get involved uh, in the 60s and 70s. Here's when anybody listening to this can have a chance to make a contribution. Well, the adults had jobs. They had families to take care they had, of. Exactly. They would have gotten fired if it, they exactly, marched. So exactly. you had to use the kids. Of course. And if you if anybody recognized the kid, your parents was fired still. Your parent, in terms of today, all I can say is if you really want to do some something that will make a difference, it's real simple. Go and vote. If you're not registered, vote. register to vote and go and vote. And you can make vote. a difference that would be just as important as what these gentlemen did in 1964 in St. Augustine. Now, I have been ran away from people house with a hole, you know, trying to get them to register <laughs> to vote, you know, well, on the right. voter's <laughs> registration drive. <laughs> well, thank you for trying. You probably got more folks to agree than try to put the water hose on you. Sam, can you share any more about your your experience growing up in St. Augustine and all this civil rights stuff? Well, like I said before, uh, during that time, we stayed in our place. Mm-hmm. We were safe. We were happy just by being around the same color that you were. And we didn't venture out of that environment. And getting back to the question that you said before, um, what do kids think about um, the things that we did today? It's not being taught in school. So how would they know unless in, uh, someone was there or they can read it from a book or listen to this podcast, yes. And um, they would know. But 
by it not being taught in school, I don't think they even care. Now, we did take workshops now how, you know, to do when we was beaten, you know. You had to get on top of the guy that's getting beat so you can take right. some of it. So after the civil rights bill passed, we were sent out to Pappy's Restaurant. And evidently when we drove up, they knew we were coming. Somebody tipped them off that we were there. And when we got out of the car, everybody, at least 20 people with ax hounds and bats in their hands. And you had to forget all of the... The workshops that you had to run. <laughs> you had to run. The workshop Go ahead, Jim. Go mean, ahead, Jim. Tell him about the time. I was, I, was, I was the only one that they caught. Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, and they were, beating, they were beating me with the bats and oh, everything. Man. How badly you know? were you hurt? It was hurting, and all of a sudden everything stopped. And I looked up, and there was a big state trooper car sitting in front of me. Probably stop. Yeah. How, how, how did you let them catch you and everybody else got away? <laughs> well, we were running that part of the story. That's we because he was, was slow. Running, <laughs> no, but we were running, you know, crisscrossing the road, and it was a well, wild. Yeah, but see, you Chris, when you should have crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I got tired. Well, you really. crossed when you should have Chris. <laughs> and they just they read me to the ground, and uh, he says uh, he looked up and he saw me. He said, "You stay here till I get back." I said, no, I'm going in your car. <laughs> and I got in the car with him. So he took me over to a filling station, and he got out. And they were still coming up to the window, you know. So uh-huh. when uh, the people back at the church found out that we had been caught, and, uh, you know, they came out. So I got out of the car, out of the state trooper car, and got in to some black folks' car. And uh, we still had a hard time yeah. trying to get back to the church. They was running us off the road. They had to take me to the hospital once we got back to the church. And they had to slip me out the back door because the clan had gathered up in front of the hospital, you know, waiting on me to come out. Wow. So we were we had to be slipped out of the hospital. Mm, you could have been a... Well, you, you got to person. remember... Um, I think that incident that James just had was in the daytime. And during that, during that time, we marched at night. And the worst time that I had was uh, we marched downtown. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, I, but to a listeners, we always marched downtown around the slave market. There's a slave market in the center of St. Augustine. And we always marched downtown around the, around the slave market and back to the black community. Mm-hmm. But this particular night was one of the worst nights that I ever had uh, there. And, and I never forget it. It was on a Thursday night. And all hell broke loose. Uh, I don't know where the Klan came from, but everybody was getting beaten, like James said, that uh, some people were falling down, um, uh, trying to cover up the elderly people that was marching, and someone was running back to uh, Washington Street. And Washington Street, once you got on the Washington Street, you were safe. And I was one of the one that ran to Washington Street, <laughs> and I was safe. But that particular night, that Thursday night, was one of the worst nights that um, I experienced during the marching of the civil rights uh, during that time in 1964. Sam, Sam and James, I, I, I want our audience to know that uh, Marvin wrote a book uh, pointing out just how violent Florida's history is. And you're talking about the Klan and your brush with the Klan. Uh, Marvin, give them just a summary. But before he go into that, before he go into the summary, let me uh, tell our listeners about how our government and, and city officials work. They did give the Klansmen a, a chance to march in St. Augustine right through the black community. And during that time, it was, it was in the daytime. They didn't want to chance them to uh, uh, come there at night. Um, they had state patrol, they had the city police, and they had 
some of the reserve from the army to guard them. And they had, oh, you should have seen the artillery that they had. They were looking for uh, things to happen, but nothing did happen during that time. And I was thankful for that. Tell our audience how violent Florida's history is, because James and Sam just had a brush in their experience. They just had a brush with some of the violence that you talk about in your book. Well, I took a look at Florida's history lynching, um, and Florida had, in terms of the number of black people in the state, proportional, the lynching in Florida was worse than Mississippi, Alabama, or any other southern state. It was terrible, particularly um, in the 1870s, and again, after the First World War in the night, early 1900s, um, Florida was just right at the top of, uh, of the most violent actions taken against blacks. And part of that was because Florida was settled so late by Confederates after the Civil War coming down into Florida with a certain attitude about black people, and that attitude translated often into lynchings. Okay. And when I go back to St. Augustine right now, they, uh, I hear, is nothing changed? <laughs> uh, my, my wife and I vacationed uh, two summers ago now in St. Augustine. Uh, it was beautiful. You know, uh, we, we, we went and visited the fort that you guys just mentioned. Uh, we, we walked at the beaches. Uh, they had some kind of a parade going on where they dressed up like in the old days with all of the, the, the soldiers and their uniforms and all that stuff. Uh, San Augustine is a beautiful place. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's a good tourist attraction. But well, hold on, yeah, I, I don't want to get too far away from it. Hold on, make your point. But my, my, my point, your point is, look how beautiful it is now. and Compare. Uh, but, but, but I don't want us to forget the history. That's the part that you guys are bringing to tie all of this together. Look at what people like me and my wife, black people, can do now in San Well, that's my point, because you said had nothing's changed, but some things have changed in, in, in San Augustine. As I said a little while ago, I stayed overnight in the same hotel where what's-his-name was pouring acid in the pool. So to say nothing has changed is to deny that we have made progress. The folks like you who demonstrated, took chances, risked your life, lied to your parents, you <laughs> made a difference. You, you otherwise, made otherwise, why did you? Why did we go through all of that if, if nothing has changed? I sort of react to that as being an overstatement of what I think reality is today. Yeah, I think it's an overstatement. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot that's changed. Whereas we had the black beach, and there was the white beach. We wasn't uh, allowed to go to the white white beach, but the beach, I think and always believe that the beaches belong to everyone. There have been a lot of changes now. You you can uh, go into the restaurants now, and like you said, Raymond, uh, the city is a beautiful city, but during that time, the city didn't have any opportunities there for a young man. So most of the students our age, after we graduated from high school, we went on off to college and we never came back. Mm. Uh, do you have any political representation now in San August, black political representation at the at the city level, city commission, mayor, things, or how is that? There was one of my coach's son became a city commissioner, Eric Jones, in San Augustine. There are uh, political positions that our blacks do have in in there i just can't recall them all right now and they are still fighting for uh equal rights there in st augustine as we speak marvin what what do you see as the i I know you said the message is for young people is to vote get involved politically vote how important is it, as a psychologist, reflecting uh, from your experience and your training as a psychologist, how important is it that, that young people are taught their history? Uh, Jane just mentioned they don't teach this, this stuff in school anymore, so the young people don't know. So what psychological, what mental disconnect occurs when we do all of this stuff that Sam and, and, and James did and then it stopped passing? You have to have an idea of where you came from before you can truly define yourself in a culture. Um, and when that history, when that past has been intentionally buried, intentionally minimized, uh, intentionally distor- distorted, 
then the people who are in impact who are impacted by that history are crippled culturally, historically, informationally. And that's what's happened in this country, in this state, in this county. I'm not quite sure that that uh, the decision to teach black history as it should be taught in Florida, in Dade County, uh, can be done because of the great risk in having to tell the truth about all the things that we were, the kinds of things we're talking about here today. Uh, Florida's history is an, is an embarrassing history when it comes to race. Florida's history is an embarrassing history when it comes to violence against black people and other minorities for that matter. Uh, but for young people to get a handle on all of that requires programs like this, requires books, requires focused school systems, and across the media in general to bring these kinds of stories and facts to their knowledge. One of the things that I was a little disappointed in, quite frankly, as we talk about schools, is when uh, Florida Memorial College moved out of St. Augustine, uh, moved down to Miami. Now, I remember when that movement took place, I had a little involvement in that. Uh, when did it take place for the audience listening? Well, I, I'm not sure of, of, of the uh, exact... 60s, uh, wasn't it? Probably uh, uh, early no, 70s? No, 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 no middle, uh, early to middle 70s. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, my, my early involvement uh, of it uh, had to do with them trying to get students to, to attend because they were moving to a new location. And at the time, I was a dean at Miami Dade College. And, of course, the administration wanted to work with me to try to get students to transfer there. Uh, I was kind of disappointed that Florida Memorial moved uh, from St. Augustine uh, because they had a historical black college right there. You know? And a lot of these movements uh, took place and were supported by historically black colleges. I just wonder uh, how differently things may have materialized. If well, Florida Memorial would have died in St. Augustine. They'd stayed there. It would have been a death knell for the college. It's a good thing they did move here. A wider reach for international students, a wider reach for Caribbean students. Right, true. And then that's why that college survived. But St. Augustine did not have enough uh, black students, potential students, to support a college. Okay, gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our guests, James and Sam, for coming in and sharing your experience with us. It's important that people like you tell our youth what happened during those turbulent days of the 60s. They don't know. They didn't learn it in school. They aren't going to get it any other way except through black eyes unfiltered. This ends this program. We look forward to talking to you Before again. you go, yes. I would like a, a shout out to the Richard J. Murray High School Bulldogs of 1964, St. Augustine, Florida. You just had to do that, didn't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> I had to yes, get in sir. there. All right. You got the shout out. The Mighty Murray Bulldogs. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Are you an artist looking for a place to record high-quality vocals to meet a certain standard? Are you looking for a certified audio engineer that was trained to work in any recording environment and proficient in Pro Tools? Are you looking for sound design, music production, movie scores, or production for any multimedia project? What about learning how to produce and operate Pro Tools? All of these things can be accomplished by working with producer A.V. of Clockwork Track. Stay locked in to at Clockwork305 on IG for updates and further details. To set up a session, A.V. can be reached at 305-812-9292. Let Clockwork Track service all of your audio production needs. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Aris Crown All Natural Products and Clockwork Tracks for providing our podcast music. Special thanks also to our editor, Track 53, as well as HGAB Studios and MRD2 Media. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at TBE Unfiltered, or go to our website at tbeunfiltered.com. And when you do, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. See you next week. Mm-hmm.